Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to present our speaker for today, Joel Mott from the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. Welcome, Joel. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for having me today. Um, Joel currently leads the Commission's efforts to raise awareness and understanding of the Pinelands. Uh, with experience in both environmental and historical interpretation, his career has comprised a wide range of positions from park ranger to museum curator. In the past, he has held interpretive and forestry positions at several national parks, historic sites, and forests, including Beaverhead National Forest, Big Hole National Battlefield, Gettysburg National Military Park, and Eisenhower National Historic Site. So welcome, Joel, again, thank you for, for speaking with our, our audience today. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, we will be taking your questions at the end of the program today. Um, however, you can submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, there is a survey that will be available at the end of the program. So please, if you have time, we ask that you please complete the survey. We always love hearing your feedback. And if you want some more information about the Pinelands in general, or maybe activities, things going on down there, you can visit the Pinelands Commission's website at www.nj.gov slash Pinelands. And I will send that out in the chat once we get underway so you can have a live link to click on. One last thing before we jump into the, the presentation, I just want to go over the Zoom dashboard. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. Uh, if you're using a mobile device, your dashboard may look a little bit different depending on the device that you're using, but all the features will still be there. Um, first and foremost, your audio settings are located on the bottom left-hand corner. So if anything does happen, you can check your audio settings there. Maybe you're plugging in a microphone or a headset or something um, and, it doesn't connect, you can check all of your settings there. At any point during the program, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here. You can click on that, that'll send an alert to me and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to resolve the problem that you're having. And as I mentioned before, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A or a chat feature, you can use either of them to submit your questions to us and we'll be happy to, to answer them for you. So that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Joel. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I will uh, go ahead and start the screen share. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, this is going to be a kind of a fun hour. I will try to do my best to uh, start in the Pine Barrens and end up in the Pine Lands. Uh, this is definitely going to be a history program with some ecology and a little bit of everything mixed in. And uh, looking forward to uh, some feedback from you folks and uh, having a nice discussion uh, towards the end with questions uh, about the, uh, the content of the program. Um, so with that, I will uh, get started. And uh, uh, to start out, we're, uh, sh I'm showing you a picture of uh, what I refer to as the Pine Plains. Uh, this is one of those uh, unique uh, areas, uh, unique ecology of the, the Pine Barrens. Um, the sandy soil, the scrubby pines, I think in a lot of ways is where that term Pine Barrens comes from. So I figured it would be a good spot to uh, start. Uh, this particular location is um, between the Garden State Parkway and the little community of Warren Grove out in what's known as the Lower or East Plains. And uh, there's a little rise and uh, this is an area where you'll see those, uh, sometimes people refer to them as pygmy or dwarf, but definitely stunted growth pine trees uh, that make up one of the classic uh, characteristics of the Pine Barrens. Uh, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll get going and um, we'll start talking about the term Pine Barrens, where it came from. And you know, as I said before, we'll try to end up in the Pine Lands uh, as we get to the end of the program. So we'll talk about with some characteristics, uh, this is, kind of the basic, um, you know, what's unique about the area. Uh, and real, uh, you know, quickly, I just want to say the water in the soil is very low in pH, um, very low in nu uh, nutrients. Uh, generally, a good pineland stream or pineland soil, a characteristic uh, area would have a pH of 3.5 to 5.5. So that's definitely well below uh, 7, which is more typical of other places. And uh, really, 
what that does is it affects the plants and the animals uh, that survive here, and they all are pretty much adapted to those, uh, you know, very acidic conditions. Um, sandy soil, we're going to see a lot of sand today, and sand's going to be a pretty important um, player in the history of the, the Pine Barrens. And um, these sandy soils, we know in some places, can absorb well over six inches of rain per hour. Uh, and there's even some soil tests that there's sands in the pine lands that could probably actually absorb almost 20 inches per hour, which is just an astronomical amount of water for uh, you know, soil or sand to be able to uh, take in. Um, fire is another important aspect of the pine lands. Um, things like the pitch pine, which is the most numerous tree in the area, all are very um, capable of handling fire. And uh, you know, fire has been an important part of uh, the area. And the plants uh, and even the animals to some degree that we find living here are all uh, able to tolerate uh, fire and they're also able to tolerate the drought conditions that are present when that water goes into the ground so quickly. Uh, an old saying we always say is uh, it could rain in the morning and there could be a forest fire in the afternoon. And uh, that's certainly been the case uh, many times in the area. Uh, some of the water in the pine lands uh, generally we refer to it as um, cedar water. It's kind of the color of tea, and it has a lot to do with the uh, vegetation breaking down, the iron that's in the soil interacting with oxygen, and kind of produces a rust. And uh, that rust in the water is really where you get that cedar color or cedar water from. And, uh, you know, the water table is pretty important. You know, we protect the pine lands to protect water. And uh, certainly um, this time of year in particular is when that water table comes closest to the surface. And that'll be another, you know, kind of character. Uh, in the background of this uh, presentation today. So there are our basic Pinelands characteristics. And let's dive right into the history. So uh, prior to uh, European settlement, um, the Lenape uh, pretty much are gonna be the native people living in the area. Uh, we know from some of our archeological work that we start to find um, uh, artifacts and things that go back to about 10,000 BC. I think that's roughly 12,000 years ago. And that's when we're first going to start to see uh, people living within uh, the area that is now known as um, the Pine Lands or the Pine Barrens. Uh, the Lenape, uh, I guess the term for Lenape would be original people. Uh, that's generally how they would refer to themselves. Uh, they're part of the Anakwan Nation um, that lived in uh, this area. Uh, their area probably existed a little bit bigger than the Pine Barrens. So the lands that um, they once lived in. Uh, are going to stretch out through New Jersey, eastern New York, um, western Long Island, in the eastern Pennsylvania, and even in northern Delaware. Uh, Lenape Hokan, I don't know if I pronounced that right, is kind of the term for that area in land of the Lenape. Um, when I was a kid, I went to school, and we were growing up, we learned the Lene Lenape. And over time, we've looked at their language, the language of the Lenape, and that was a little bit of a misnomer. It was more, it was kind of saying the original, original people. So now, generally, most people use the term Lenape. Um, for the most part, they stayed on the coast. Uh, you're going to see, um, or we have seen or learned, that there was substantial settlements on the Delaware side and on the Atlantic coastline. And uh, they're going to kind of go in and out of the Pine Barrens um, as a means of travel, but for natural resources. And they're really going to focus their existence on those natural resources, particularly at the shore, uh, fish, clams, oysters. Um, we definitely have evidence that they did a little manipulation with uh, fire. They probably burned some areas from time to time. And they also were uh, quite adept at growing things like corn and squash. So they really worked with the, uh, you know, the area around them. And then I think in a lot of ways believe that they are part of the system. They were part of the earth and the earth was part of them. Um, we do also know that they had a lot of interaction and they certainly traded and had connections with uh, other people, other native peoples up and down the East Coast and even further on. So um, the image there is an image that was uh, done by Herbert and John Kraft. They're two, uh, two of the folks that are pretty well known and done a lot of studies into uh, you know, the, the native Lenape uh, that were living here in, in South Jersey prior to uh, European settlement. Um, once uh, the Europeans start to come down to the area, um, we're going to start to see some rapid changes. Uh, in about 1614, uh, Captain uh, Cornelius Joe Hampson is going to be uh, part of Henry Hudson's crew. 
He's going to come down through the Jersey Shore, and he's kind of coined the phrase uh, Iron Haven. And that's where we're going to get terms like Little Egg Harbor, Great Egg Harbor. Uh, and it's going to be based on the abundance of the eggs that he's going to see, uh, particularly in the inlets as he is exploring, uh, you know, southern New Jersey. Um, by the 1630s uh, through the 1650s, you're going to start to see some early trading posts uh, developed uh, in South Jersey, primarily along uh, the Delaware. Uh, the Swedes, the Finns, and the Dutch are all going to have, uh, you know, forts and are going to start to trade. Um, initially, particularly with the Swedes, uh, they're going to have relatively good relations with the native Lenape, and um, they're going to kind of get along. They're going to kind of, you know, they're mutually benefit each other in a lot of ways. Um, eventually, over time, the Dutch is going to kind of win out and they're going to kind of take over the New Jersey, which is going to be at that point in time going to be known as New Netherlands. Um, that's going to hold out for a little while, but around uh, 1664, uh, with the Treaty of Westminster, uh, England is going to, you know, take it over. And uh, at that point, it's going to then be known as New Jersey. And we all, if we're not, we don't know, but we will know as we go a little further, uh, New Jersey is generally going to be split uh, between East and West. And uh, West being the portion of South, Southern New Jersey, East ha having more of Northern New Jersey, but the boundary line is going to kind of split the state and go right out into uh, Little Lake Harbor Bay, which is also the Southern portion of Barnegat Bay. And that's uh, where that line is going to split. Um, in 1673, uh, West New Jersey is uh, primarily going to be uh, sold to Quaker interest, and that's really going to start to uh, move some more migration. And we're going to start to see over the next few years, uh, you know, Quaker folks, but also people associated with the whaling industry are going to move kind of from southern uh, New England down through Long Island. Uh, eventually, they're going to come across into what's Monmouth County today. Um, they're going to send some folks down into uh, Cape May, also over on the Delaware side in Burlington. And, uh, you know, they're going to start to uh, kind of settle, uh, you know, portions of uh, southern New Jersey based initially on whaling, but also on some other interests uh, in the area. Uh, this is a, an old map. This is a, a map that's kind of um, zoned in. This is a mail route map from uh, 1729. And uh, like I said before, you can start to see that population come across, start to settle in Monmouth County, come over here in Burlington County. Over here is some of the early settlements from the Swedes and the Finns. And uh, if you look at the center, there's not so much on. You see woodland over here, but you do start to see the inlets down here is Little Egg and Great, uh, Great Egg. So the, the pine lands is gonna make up this portion, the sub central portion of uh, Southern New Jersey. And uh, that's as things start to get going, that's pretty much what the map looks like. And, uh, you know, uh, the Lenape in some ways are, uh, I don't wanna just say pushed aside, but we do start to see around 1699, uh, some of their lands, particularly along the coast are gonna start to be purchased. Uh, in some cases, uh, they'd be purchased with uh, beads and shells or some trinkets. Uh, I think the concept of owning land was foreign to them. They were part of land, they didn't own the land. So in a lot of ways, they didn't really understand if they were selling their land, because how could anyone own land because you're part of the land? Uh, so that's kind of you know, a bigger story that you know, we don't wanna uh, talk too much about um, because we just don't have time to get in all these uh, chapters of uh, Pine Barrens history. Uh, so this also is about the time that Pine Barrens comes to play. Uh, you know, I referred to the Native Americans as growing corn and squash and other things. Um, but it, the sandy soils really inhibited, particularly the Europeans, from growing wheat and some of those other more uh, stable food crops, um, that sandy soil. And uh, so that's where that term pine barrens comes from. And I think that was certainly reinforced when uh, the early uh, folks explored the area and saw those pine plains areas that I started out with, it, it almost like a desert feel. And um, that's where that term pine barrens uh, comes from. Uh, however, uh, you know, the area really, as we say, sometimes wasn't that barren. Uh, it yielded great uh, lumber, things like cedar, oak, uh, from the pitch pine in particular. They were able to get pitch and tar. They also were able to process and make turpentine. And, um, you know, there was just a vast forested area uh, that really provided for, you know, 
uh, all the things you needed to make a, a substantial civilization. Um, not too long after that, uh, you're going to start to see the construction of wooden ships. Uh, coastal trade is going to flourish, particularly you know, up and down both the Delaware and the Atlantic coast. Uh, boat building is going to be started, and still to this day, uh, there is still a substantial boat building industry in southern New Jersey, and it really has its roots all the way back to uh, that initial uh, settlement. Um, here's a picture of a large uh, boat that was being built in Mays Landing. And then above this is just a, uh, this is a picture of an old uh, postcard, but it typifies what the area could have looked like, you know, back in the, you know, early 1700s when folks first started to, uh, you know, build houses and, uh, you know, generally um, live along what we're gonna say are gonna be the streams or the swamps. Uh, the, most of the waters in the pine lands are going to flow from the pine lands out to the Atlantic coast or the Delaware Bay. And uh, along those swamps and along those streams is really where uh, some of the early settlements are going to start to pop up. Uh, they're going to be able to use that power to, to run meat, uh, mills. And certainly sawmills and grist mills are going to certainly be a very important part of uh, everyday life as folks start to you know, live in the Pine Barrens area. Um, industry and revolution, as we go a little bit further into the 1700s, um, we're going to start to see charcoaling. Charcoaling is going to be really one of the first industries of the Pine Barrens, and uh, that's going to start in the early 1740s. Um, by the 1760s, uh, operations are going to be put in place where they're going to use that charcoal to uh, melt down some of the bog iron that was found uh, in the area, and that's going to lead to you know, a pretty substantial industry. Uh, things like cannonballs and pots and pans are going to be made. Um, now, I mentioned earlier about the cedar water, that rust uh, in the water over thousands and thousands of years, that rust would combine with things like sandstone, and that's where the bog iron is going to come from. So the bog iron was generally dug up, and then it was floated down to uh, large furnaces. Uh, here's an example of what a furnace would have been like, say, at places like Batstow. Batstow is going to be a pretty... Um, well-known historical site. And the idea is they're going to add clamshells and that iron is going to be melted. And as that iron comes down, it's usually melted into channels by sand. Uh, they refer to that as like the sucklings of a pig. And that's where you're going to find that term pig iron. So, you know, right off the bat, early on in the Pine Barrens, you're going to start to see industry, uh, charcoal and uh, bog iron. It's going to be, you know, pretty important. Um, 1758 is kind of an interesting time. Uh, the first uh, Native American uh, reservation or Indian reservation is going to be established in Brotherton, which is out by uh, Shemung today. It was known as Indian Mills. Uh, and the idea was it was going to uh, provide an area where some of the Native Lenape that were still living in the area uh, could kind of farm for themselves and kind of work together with uh, some of the, the European settlers. So that's the idea of Brotherton would be, everyone would be a brother. And um, it starts out relatively prosperous, but uh, by about 1802, most of the Native Americans are gonna either move to New York state or move out to other places. And eventually uh, the land is gonna be sold and the profits uh, in theory were given back to those uh, Lenape from the area. So that's in 1758 when it started. Um, uh, 1765 is kind of an interesting time. Uh, there's a guy named Reuben Tucker who is going to purchase some uh, land. He's going to purchase an island off of uh, Tuckerton or over towards what's now uh, Beach Haven or Long Beach Island. Uh, back in those days, there was Long, Long Beach, then Short Beach, which is Tucker's Island, and then the next little island is Little Beach. So when Reuben Tucker purchased it in 1765, his idea was to start a resort. And that is really going to be one of the first resorts along the Jersey Shore is going to be uh, Tucker's Island. Um, 1775, uh, the start of the Revolutionary War. Uh, you know, the, the impact here in southern New Jersey uh, after the Declaration of Independence, uh, the area is known a lot for the privateers and the pine robbers. Um, uh, privateers, I'll take them first. Um, generally, they are a pirate who has a a uh, license, basically a letter of marquee to attack uh, the enemy or shipping from another country. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, uh, the American privateers 
really had a huge impact on uh, British shipping up and down the whole entire Atlantic seaboard, um, particularly in this area of southern New Jersey. It was known as a hotbed. Uh, you know, this is costing huge economic losses to uh, the English uh, because of the loss of these uh, cargoes that are being captured by these local privateers um, out of a little egg inlet, which leads to Great Bay, which leads to what we now we call the Mullica River. Back in those days, it was referred to as the Little Egg River. Uh, there was an area known as Chestnut Neck, and Chestnut Neck was really one of the, you know, hotbeds and most prosperous uh, privateering places. So that's going to come into play a little bit later. Uh, we know by about 1878, uh, there's going to be about 30 armed sloops that are all operating out of the, uh, the Egg Harbor area. Uh, Egg Harbor, Little Egg Harbor, those terms kind of go back and forth. You see Egg Harbor first, later on you see Little Egg Harbor. Uh, it's confusing today because there's a Little Egg Harbor Township. There's also an Egg Harbor Township. There's an Egg Harbor City, uh, but it all goes back, uh, we said back before, to um, Captain Cornelius when uh, he discovered the area in the early 1600s. Um, the pine robbers, uh, most of the pine robbers are generally known as uh, Tories. Um, there's two pretty good examples. There's more, of course, but the two that usually stick out are a guy named Joe Mulliner. Uh, Joe Mulliner uh, was kind of known as the Robin Hood of the Pine Barons. He also was known for his dancing abilities. He loved to go to the local taverns, supposedly, and uh, you know, dance with the ladies. Um, but he also was known to give back. He has a much better reputation than another outlaw, a guy by the name of John Bacon. John Bacon uh, is generally referred to as the notorious Tory outlaw. Uh, he had captured uh, some colonial American privateers. He had, there's been massacres. Uh, he had a few engagements, one on Long Beach Island by Barnegat Light. There was another episode in uh, Stafford Township uh, where there was uh, some, some folks were, uh, were killed in a, in a small skirmish. So he really has a bad reputation. Uh, in the end, both uh, Mulliner and um, uh, John Bacon were both put to death. And uh, we'll, as we, you know, we'll go a little bit further, one of the last engagements of the Revolutionary War could have been a small skirmish at a little tavern uh, in what's Barnegat today, but known as Cedarbridge Tavern that involved uh, John Bacon. Um, this is kind of a great picture here. This is a, a more of a modern day photo, but it really explains the charcoal making process uh, this is a guy named George Cummel. He was one of the last charcoal makers. And literally, this is how they would make charcoal. You would have a stack of uh, pitch pine, and you would have dirt and moss and all kinds of things to kind of cover up uh, and, and regulate with the air. And over a period of a few days to a week or so, uh, you would regulate the fire, and you would smolder down that pile of what was logs eventually to chunks of charcoal. And uh, you know, charcoal was the fuel for the for the uh, bog iron industry, but it's also gonna be very important and it's gonna be exported uh, to places like New York and Philadelphia. And it's gonna be how many people heat their homes, particularly their stoves. It's, it's better for cooking if you're gonna use a stove. So that's a real important um, aspect of uh, things going on in Pine Barrens. There's a cannonball. Uh, this is just, I was fortunate to grow up in the area and when I was a kid in Tuckerton, I uh, stumbled through an area which was known as Mott's Field, and I actually tripped over this cannonball, and I still have it today. It's just a solid six-pound shot, uh, and that's typical of you know, some of the products they would have been making uh, at, say, a place like that still. This is uh, kind of a cool map. This is a 1776 map, and uh, what it really starts to show is, uh, you know, as the area develops, you still have a lot of people on the coast and a lot of people on the coast, but not a lot of folks in the center. And they still refer to the area as Sandy Barren Desert. So it's kind of interesting. Um, you start to see some roads at this point. So there's going to be some connections, people going through the, through the pine lands or the pine barrens at the time. And, um, you know, we talked about east and west New Jersey. So here's that split, if you can see my mouse right there. And then you have West Jersey and East Jersey. Um, talk about watersheds that's also more of a modern term for today but the watersheds back then are still the same watersheds today so uh going west you have the rancocas watershed which goes over towards delaware uh, over on the northern part of barnegat bay you have the tom's river watershed 
which goes in the Barnick Bay or the Barnick Bay watershed. Uh, places like Cedar Creek, Oyster Creek, uh, Forkett River all flow into Barnegat Bay. A little bit further south, you have the Mullica River, which is going to flow into Great Bay. Uh, we refer to it as the Mullica today. Back in 1776, it was still referred to as the Little Egg River. A little further south, uh, you have the Great Egg Harbor River, which flows generally into the south, into the Atlantic. The Tuckahoe River is part of that system, and that flows down today, present day, what's kind of like Summers Point in Ocean City. And then on the far kind of western side flowing south, you have the Morris River, which flows down into the Delaware Bay. So they're the, you know, the five watersheds of the, the area, which are still the same five watersheds today. Um, uh, specifically, uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, a nest of rebel pirates refers to the area, the area around Chestnut Neck and Little Lake Harbor. Um, in 1778, uh, the British had a full campaign. I think they took about 14 ships. They traveled from New York City down to the area and their uh, priorities or their goal was to uh, stop um, the pirateering out of Chestnut Neck, but also to head up the river, up the Little Egg, which is now the Malacca, to Batstow to curtail the iron making activities that were going on there. Um, they're gonna come into the area in October of 1776, or excuse me, 1778, they're going to run into some problems right away. They're going to realize, and I happen to do a lot of fishing on my spare time, and if you're ever in the area of Little Lake Inlet or Great Bay or the southern portion of Barnegat Bay, there's a lot of sandbars. And uh, right away, they're going to have trouble navigating, and they're not really going to be able to bring a lot of their big ships in, and it's really going to foul up the whole operation. Uh, on October 6th, they are able to get some forces up to the area uh, around Chestnut Neck, and there's going to be kind of a battle there. Uh, the locals are going to kind of uh, hold the area. Uh, the town is burned. A couple of the ships are burned. Um, but the, the local resistance or the local uh, Minutemen, as you would say, uh, were able to slow down and put enough of a fear into the British that they felt they couldn't go any further west up the Mullica towards Batstow. Uh, so they're kind of hampered. They do, you know, temporarily kind of stop the pirateering at Chestnut Neck, but it doesn't uh, take too long. And they're right back up in speed once uh, the British leave. About a week later, uh, the British are still in the area and they're kind of frustrated. And on October 15th of uh, 1778, uh, they're going to send a detachment of roughly 200 soldiers um, to the southern portion of what's now Mystic Islands a place called Osborne Island. Uh, they're gonna come ashore and they're gonna head up. Uh, there's a road there now known as Radio Road, uh, but Radio Road wasn't Radio Road back then. And uh, as they're crossing some of the, the creeks on their way to the town um, towards what's tuckered in the Little Lake Harbor, they're going to um, take uh, some of the planks off one of the big creeks. There's a creek called, actually called Big Creek. They're gonna remove the planks from the creek and they're gonna head up uh, their force is commanded by a guy named uh, Patrick Ferguson, and um, he's going to run into the pickets of uh, Kashmir Pulaski. Pulaski was in Trenton not too long before this, and uh, George Washington had gave Pulaski orders to go to this area of Egg Harbor and to protect it from this campaign of the British. Um, they're going to get there. Uh, Ferguson's men are going to run into Pulaski's pickets. There's going to be a skirmish. Um, from everything we can tell, we think that about 30 to 50 soldiers were massacred in that skirmish and were buried later on uh, in that area, which is now known as Mystic Islands, that portion of Little Lake Harbor. Um, before Pulaski, and he had basically uh, dragoons or cavalry, before he is able to catch back up with the British, they're going to cross the creek, throw the planks in the water, therefore limiting Pulaski's ability to catch them, and they're going to head back out into Great Bay. Uh, and after a few more days, once they finally um, realize they can't escape with the big ships, they're going to scuttle some of their bigger ships and they're, they're going to head back to New York in, in, many, in many ways, which is probably a failed campaign. Um, they, they didn't have the effect, the Brit British is uh, certainly that they were looking for. One of the best sources uh, about this whole story is uh, a book that was written by a guy named Franklin Camp. And it was published by the Batstow Citizens Committee. And uh, it's still available to, today for purchase. 
uh, at the bookstore out of Batstow. And um, Franklin Kent passed away a couple years ago, but it's just an absolutely fantastic book that goes in the incredible detail of uh, that campaign and the, the battles that occurred uh, you know, in Chestnut Neck and Little Egg Harbor uh, in 1778. Down below is a really cool mural. This mural was uh, painted by John Wanamaker of Philadelphia, and it was um, uh, by uh, Fred and Ethel Noyes. If you're familiar with the area um, in Smithville, which is in Atlantic County, part of Galloway Township, there's Smithville Village, and this mural uh, was painted, and uh, to this day, I still believe, is in the restaurant, which is called Fred and Ethel's, down there in that little uh, area of Smithville. So that's a, you know, it's a reproduction of what they thought may have happened at the time of the battle. Probably a little bit exaggerated because those big ships would have never been able to get that far up the Mullica River. But, uh, you know, that's kind of how history carries on. So uh, we, we still have the remnants of the, the battle today. Um, after the Revolutionary War, things, uh, you know, start to develop into the 1800s. And um, it's really a kind of a bountiful harvest. You know, initially we talked about whaling. A lot of the first uh, people to come down the coast were associated with whaling. Um, by the 1800s, uh, the, the whaling kind of ceased to exist right off the shore. I mean, literally they were able to launch boats from the beach and go out and, uh, and get some of the whales. The, by 1800, that wasn't happening so much. And um, the efforts are really going to change to fishing, hunting, and the harvesting of shellfishing. And uh, the area is going to be known uh, particularly for the oysters. Um, ducks are going to be sold by the barrel to places like New York and Philadelphia. Um, eventually, there's going to be pound fishing right off the beach. And uh, that is, is really going to kind of set the stage going forward, uh, again, based on a lot of those natural resources that are within the area. Um, in 1816, we know that there is a, a Isaac Jenkins starts a stage, which is going to go from um, Philadelphia, Camden, all the way down to Tuckerton. Um, we do know even prior to that, maybe even back into the, 18, uh, the 1770s, there was stages just not running on a, a really everyday basis. Uh, Jenkins stage is going to run once a week. It's going to be two days down and two days back. So it's basically a two-day trip from, say, Philadelphia or Camden down to the Jersey Shore uh, in Tuckerton. Uh, again, and this is another time I'll mention charcoal. This is really the heyday of the charcoal era when they were really consuming lots and lots of wood, uh, primarily pine uh, that was made in the charcoal. And like I said before, that's primarily going to New York and Philadelphia and every place in between because that's what people used for their stoves. I uh, got some old postcards here. This is seed oysters being collected in Tuckerton. Uh, here's a, a duck hunting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit maybe about the Barnegat Bay sneak box towards the end of the program. We talk about some of the history and the culture, the heritage. Uh, and then here's an image from some of the pound fishermen uh, that were uh, came down to the Jersey Shore. Uh, one of the neat stories about the Pine Barrens is there's lots of different immigrant communities that come to the Pine Barrens for different reasons. Uh, one of them is going to be a lot of fishing or fishermen from Norway are going to make their way to the Jersey Shore, particularly for the pound fishing. But we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, one of the legends of the Pine Lands, the Pine Barrens for sure, is Dr. James Still. Uh, Dr. Still was known as the Black Doctor of the Pines. Uh, he was born in 1812. Uh, his family had uh, his, both his mom and his dad were slaves at one point in time. Uh, they had come to New Jersey and they had settled in what is known as Indian Mills. And it's the same place where the Brotherton Reservation was today known as Shemung. Um, Dr. Still uh, in his younger years was a laborer. He worked, you know, spent a lot of time doing a lot of odd jobs. Uh, over time, he was able to uh, educate himself. He was able to go and learn about some of the different uh, plants and herbal things that you could find in the area. And uh, later in his life is going to be a very successful, uh, you know, uh, medical doctor to some regards. Uh, there certainly was probably some prejudice that he faced, but uh, he was known as, you know, a great healer in a lot of ways. Um, his family was pretty important and pretty prominent. I think uh, his parents may have had upwards of 14 or 18 children. And one of his younger brothers was a guy by the name of William Still, who was one of the very uh, 
important and most active agents of the Underground Railroad. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're gonna see over time is a lot of the African Americans uh, are gonna come into Southern New Jersey uh, through the Underground Railroad. And over time, you're gonna start to see smaller little populations of Afri African American groups in Southern New Jersey, uh, particularly as Atlantic City really starts to take off. There's the Atlantic City at one point in time, probably around 1900, is gonna probably the, have the largest portion of African American people uh, in all of New Jersey, not just uh, the Pine Barrens area. Uh, in 1882, uh, James passed away and he was buried near Mount Laurel. Uh, uh, which is just on the, you know, the western edge of the, uh, the Pine Barrens. Um, cranberry culture. Uh, cranberries are a native Pinelands plant that we see um, every day. If you're out and about, say, along the Wading River, if you go canoeing and kayaking, you're going to see these cranberries. In the 1830s to the 1840s, uh, the idea was that they could start to cultivate cranberries and it's when they start to create cranberry bogs. Um, initially, the cranberries are going to be grown, but they're going to be harvested by hand. Uh, up here in the corner is a uh, cranberry rake, and uh, you're going to use the rake to scoop through uh, the berry bushes. Uh, they really want a bush, it was more of a vine, and uh, you could then separate the berries from the vine, and uh, it's going to be the beginning of uh, the cranberry industry, which is going to have a huge economic impact here in the, the Pine Barrens. Um, today, most of the cranberries that are harvested are harvested in a wet harvest. Uh, towards the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, folks are gonna start to realize that you could remove the berries from the vines and what's gonna happen is the good berries are gonna float to the top. So modern day, most of the cranberries are harvested in what's called a wet harvest where they remove the berries from the vine they flow to the top and they are collected. Um, back in the old days, when they were still hand picking the cranberries, uh, most of the um, packing facilities had a series of shells and a conveyor belt and the berries would be kind of put up the conveyor belt. Once they'd hit the shelf, the berries would drop and uh, all the good berries would have to bounce over and they would have a series of these shells or shelves and the good berries that would keep bouncing would be the berries that they would keep. And the ones that did not bounce would be the ones that they were, weren't good and they would get rid of them. But over time, that whole system was really replaced with the, uh, the wet harvest. Um, shifting sands. I said sand was gonna be an important uh, player. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, the picture right here is an example of an early uh, Pine Barrens glass. This is a, a perfume bottle that was made um, in uh, Atlantic, which is uh, the Atlantic Glassworks, which is probably over what we would refer to as Green Bank today. Uh, it was Crowley Town, was uh, named for a prominent glassmaker, a guy by the name of Samuel Crowley. Um, Samuel Crowley uh, was good friends with a guy named John Mason. In about 1858, John Mason is going to get a patent for the Mason jar. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I kind of got ahead of myself. Um, from about the 1820s to the 1890s is really where the glass industry is going to have its heyday. Uh, you know, talk about some of the, the immigrants that come to the area. Uh, the glass making skills are definitely going to be brought to the area by some uh, of the uh, German immigrants that come to southern New Jersey. Uh, so that's where you're going to start to see that influence of glass. And that down the bottom of this picture, you can see some of that white sugar sand. And that white sugar sand uh, typically would have an uh, aqua color glass, and that's uh, clearly present here in the, that Crowley Town perfume bottle. Um, railroads are kind of interesting. So as bog iron kind of wanes, a lot of that money is Philadelphia money that was invested in the bog iron. Um, you know, the bog iron eventually is going to move, say, to northern uh, eastern Pennsylvania, but that money is going to stay. And some of that money is going to go into railroads. So in 1854, you're going to see a railroad from Camden to Atlantic City. Uh, a little bit later, there's going to be another trunk line that's going to go from Whiting down to Tuckerton. So again, that's going to be like another chapter. That's going to be the idea with tourism and people now moving to the Jersey Shore through the Pine Barrens. Um, 1854, uh, Egg Harbor City 
It's going to be founded as a farming or agricultural uh, community uh, by German Americans who were living in the Philadelphia area. So it's another one of those immigrant um, enclaves in, in the Pine Barrens. Uh, 1858, again, that's uh, when John Mason gets his patent for uh, his mason glass, his mason jar. Um, basically, uh, Samuel Crowley was able to develop a way to make the glass with the uh, threads to thread the cap. And then John Mason was able to make the caps and uh, was able to get the patent for it in November 30th of 1880. Um, so you could say in a lot of ways, the mason jars were uh, developed here in the Pine Barrens. Um, the American Civil War, I would say 1880 to 1860 rather to 1865. Um, New Jersey is kind of interesting. New Jersey was definitely a Northern uh, state. Um, there are definitely a lot of the Quakers uh, that were living in the area prior to. Uh, there was a, certainly a strong abolitionist movement, uh, particularly in Southern New Jersey. And I said before with that, the Still family, uh, and prior to that, you know, a lot of African-Americans freed slaves or escaped slaves had come to Southern New Jersey. Um, Northern New Jersey is a little interesting. Northern New Jersey has a large um, textile uh, production. So they made a lot of clothes and products in North Jersey based on the cotton industry. So Northern New Jersey had a fair amount of um, sympathies for the South in a lot of ways. And I think we're, during the Civil War, the majority of soldiers that fought for New Jersey are gonna be from the Southern portion of the state. Uh, when, uh, you know, when Abraham Lincoln runs for his second term, uh, General McCullen, who was at one time one of his generals runs for president. He's from Northern New Jersey. He's a, he was a Democratic candidate for the, you know, I think the election of 1864, but that just shows some of that sentiment uh, in the Northern part of the state or the, the sympathy for, for the South. Um, also around that same time period, around the Civil War is really when we see the end of the bog iron industry. Um, they're gonna find coal, and they're gonna find better iron in, uh, up, up by Scranton, up in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And so, and also one of the factors that kind of kills the bog iron is early on, they could dig bog iron up and then float it to the furnaces very easily. Once they exhausted those sources of iron, they then had to put it on wagons and truck it and it just was getting too expensive. So ultimately that's why the bog iron industry is gonna kind of leave uh, the, the, the Pine Barrens area. Um, we mentioned the railroad down the Tuckerton um, in 1872. Uh, 1876, uh, Joseph Wharton, again, Philadelphia money, uh, Joseph Wharton is going to uh, purchase a large piece of land, you know, a lot of the Mullica River watershed, a lot of the land around Batstow. And uh, Batstow, as I said before, was a pretty substantial um, bog iron industry. Uh, prior to Wharton, they had kind of switched over to making glass. Uh, making glass was profitable, but it was also, um, they used a lot of fire. And Batstow had burned a couple times due to uh, accidents with the glass making industry. But Wharton's idea was we could get, he could gather rather, all of those natural resources, all that water. Where was he coming from? Philadelphia. The water situation in Philadelphia wasn't very good. And he really wanted to buy that area so he could then take that water and he could sell it or he could bring it over to Philadelphia. Um, in 1878, the New Jersey legislature is gonna block those efforts. They're gonna pass legislation, basically prohibiting the export of New Jersey water out of the state. And that's really gonna curtail um, uh, Wharton's plan. Um, I'll show you a map of his uh, aqueduct system in a little bit. And then uh, in 1882, uh, the Alliance Colony is founded in, uh, this is a successful Jewish agricultural um, community that is set up down near Vineland. There's a number of others as well. Later on, there's a, a place in Atlanta County um, down by Buena Vista called Mizpah. And that's gonna be another uh, a Jewish community uh, settled within the, the, the area of the, the Pine Barrens. Uh, so here's Wharton's map. Um, you know, it's amazing to think about today, but this is really what his plan was to dam up an aqueduct and take the water from the, the Mullica River watershed basically. And instead of going east to the Atlantic, he's gonna send it west over to Philadelphia. And that was uh, really his plan. Uh, you can see a copy of this map 
down at the uh, visitor center uh, for Batstow Village for or Wharton State Forest. Um, next chapter around the turn of the century, 1900 that is, uh, blueberries and reforestation. Um, because of the bog iron, because of the boat building, um, all those products, uh, there's you know stories that you could uh, climb up the, the fire towers in the area and you couldn't see any trees. Uh, the area had been denuded of many of the trees because you know people were using the wood for their houses, for heat, uh, for building boats, for charcoal. So in 1905, uh, the state of New Jersey is going to start Bass River State Forest, the first state forest, as basically a tree plantation to start replanting trees to reforest the area. Um, in a lot of cases, they're going to they're going to plant white pine because white pine wasn't native to the pine lands, but it was a much more valuable wood they thought than say the, the native pitch pine. So you're going to start to have uh, these state forests to regrow the forest of the pine lands or the pine barrens uh, around 1905. Now areas that were still forested because of the conditions, there was still the problem of the forest fires. So very shortly after the establishment of the state forest, the state forest fire service established in 1906. And uh, they're going to be start to be very um, inventive and creative and over many years are gonna be probably one of the leading um, state agencies as far as all the states, as far as the ability to maintain and to uh, you know, prevent forest fires uh, in the area. 1910, uh, Penn State Forest is established. Uh, Penn State Forest is um, kind of out where we would say Lake Oswego is today, out kind of between Chatsworth and Route 72. Um, 1916 is a pretty important time for uh, some other Pinelands native plants. Um, Elizabeth White uh, lived in the area. Uh, the New Jersey Pinelands Commission office is actually at her childhood home. We're at a place called Fenwick Manor, which was uh, where her grandfather uh, uh, lived in uh, near New Lisbon or Pemberton, New Jersey. His family had developed some of the original cranberry box and uh, Elizabeth uh, was working with the idea of cultivating the blueberry. Uh, there's a lot of wild native blueberries that grow throughout the Pine Barrens. There's low bush, there's high bush, um, there's some smaller huckleberries. And the idea was to try to find a berry that was big and was sweet. And uh, her efforts, uh, particularly she worked with a guy named Dr. Colville, who was part of um, the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, Elizabeth would send some of the local folks out into the area. They come back with the different berry varieties. And um, by 1916, they were able to come up with a hybrid uh, blueberry based on the high bush blueberry. Uh, and they were able to bring it the first harvest of this cultivated berry. And still to this day, that is in many ways the basis of the blueberry industry, which is you know, one of the, the largest economic forces in Southern New Jersey. So cranberries and blueberries, both native pineless plants, still to this day are very important parts of uh, you know, the, the economics of uh, our area. Um, uh, bring in World War I just a little bit. Um, Belcoville was established as a munitions plant down near Mays Landing. Uh, there was another one also, Amatol, uh, just as another example of some of the industry uh, that was in the Pinelands. So during World War I, there was a number of places where they created small little factory towns, basically, to uh, you know, uh, create munitions for World War I. Um, kind of getting to that aviation section of the program. Um, uh, 1928, uh, there's a fellow by the name of Emilio Carenza. Uh, Emilio is kind of a famous pilot. Uh, in some ways, he was known as the Charles Lindbergh of Mexico. Uh, he had a goodwill flight where he flew from Mexico City to New York City, uh, and he was in New York City, and eventually he's going to leave New York and head back towards uh, Mexico, and uh, he's going to fly into a thunderstorm, and he's going to crash in July of 1928. Um, the story is very interesting. Uh, Emilio's family at one point in time was um, kind of the kind of a ruling family in Mexico. They had a, a lot of political clout. Over time, that's going to change, and uh, it really changes 
during his flight in, in some ways, because it took a while. It wasn't just a quick couple of days. It took a series of, uh, I think maybe about a month for him to get from Mexico all the way to New York City. At some point in time, um, you know, it's the spring or July rather, not the spring, the summer. There's a lot of thunderstorms. So he's been delayed for a little while. Uh, the story is he received a telegram from one of his commanders that asked what was taking so long and kind of challenged uh, his flying abilities. And uh, he got the telegram, left dinner, got in his plane, took off and flew right into that thunderstorm uh, where he crashed and unfortunately died uh, in 1928. Um, to this day, you can find a marker in the area near where his uh, body was found and the plane crashed. Um, you know, back at the time, the, uh, the first group that could get to him to rescue was the VFW from uh, Mount Holly. So that just shows you the, how spread out population was back in those days. Uh, 1937, uh, there's an incident that's gonna happen in Lakehurst. Uh, the German Zeppelin, the Hindenburg, is going to uh, catch fire and explode. Uh, you can still see um, the hangars to this day from where the Hindenburg uh, was stored and where other Zeppelins were stored as well. And um, in 1946, uh, an area outside of Warren Grove was set up as the Warren Grove, Grange, the Warren Grove um, Range, and that was a World War II weapons research area or a bombing range, and that's still to this day uh, utilized by the New Jersey National Guard. And primarily, they're going to use F-16s. They also use A-10s, but if you're in the southern New Jersey around the Pine Barrens, uh, very frequently, you'll see uh, the F-16s and the A-10s uh, practicing there at the uh, Warren Grove Range. Um, start to change themes a little bit as we get into the, the mid-1950s. Talk about the um, conservation comes to age. Um, in around 1950, there's going to be groups of conservationists. Uh, one of the more uh, notable is the Pine Barrens conservationists. And what they're going to start to do is they're going to start to uh, educate people about the Pine Barrens. They're going to start to uh, take photographs. They're going to start to get out and about and really kind of, you know, bring awareness to the wonders of uh, the, the Pine Barrens. Um, two people in particular, a lady by the name of uh, Dot and her husband Everett Brooks are associated with the group. There's a lot of other people as well, but they're going to put together an old school slideshow. Uh, the beauty of the bogs and the barrens. And they're really going to start to promote and educate people about the Pine Barrens. Um, in 1954, a great piece of the puzzle is going to uh, be put in place. And New Jersey is going to buy those properties uh, that Joseph Wharton had purchased so many years ago. Uh, and that's going to create Wharton State Forest. And that really becomes the cornerstone and the, the really first building block in uh, protecting the Pine Barrens. Um, uh, 18, or excuse me, 1964, a little bit later, um, you start to see the term pine, pine lands show up. Uh, there's going to be a Pine Lands Regional Planning Board. They see all this land, all this open area. They think, man, what could we do with all this open land? Well, at the time, they were developing the Concord. And the idea was to build supersonic jet ports all around the country, um, primarily Ocean County and Burlington County had the idea, why don't we build it out in the middle of the Pine Barrens? Um, so out in what is primarily today the preservation area, the most protected part of the Pine Barrens is where they wanted to have this airport and a city of about 250,000 people. Um, it didn't happen. Ultimately, I think the federal government decided to put more money into the airports around New York, like LaGuardia and JFK, instead of developing these other jet ports. And um, so the Pine Barrens were spared from being turned into this uh, gigantic jet port. But that really, again, kind of focused people on preservation and the idea of protecting the area. Uh, not too long after that, a guy by the name of John McPhee, who had probably learned about the Pine Barrens from the Pine Barrens conservationist, is going to write a book called The Pine Barrens. And he's going to spend some time. He's going to head out into the area. He's going to meet some of the locals that are living in the area. And uh, it's a great read. It's a, a very quick book to read and kind of captures the flavor of the Pine Barrens. Uh, there's a person he interviews uh, named Fred Brown in the book, 
which is who I would consider a, a piney, uh, someone who lives off the land or lived off of uh, the area. And uh, one of the things McPhee ends his book with is the fact that you got to go see it now because it's probably not going to be here for too long. Um, fortunately, John McPhee's brother was friends with a guy named Brendan Byrne, who happens to become governor of New Jersey in the late 70s. And one of the things Governor Byrne is going to tell John McPhee is that he's going to do what he can to not let that happen, to preserve the Pinelands. Uh, also, by that time, Atlantic City is going to start to gain some momentum, and it's going to be uh, legalized gambling. Um, Jim Florio at the time was in Congress, and he's also going to start to think about preserving the Pine Barrens. Uh, similar to today, there's kind of an oil crunch. The idea was kind of put out there that maybe we could go offshore, we could get some oil. Where are there some oil refineries? In Philadelphia. Maybe we can pipeline the oil from the ocean to the refineries in Philadelphia through the Pinelands. So uh, Jim Florio didn't think that was a good idea. And so that's another kind of piece of the puzzle that comes together ultimately to uh, protect the Pinelands. Plus the idea with Atlantic City, the development pressure. If you had a resort with a lot of casinos, that meant there's gonna be more people to work at the casinos. So ultimately that really would put the pressure to develop the Pinelands. And all those factors really came into play to ultimately protect uh, the Pinelands as we know it today. Um, specifically in uh, 1978, um, uh, the federal government is gonna pass the National Parks and Recreation Act. And uh, that is gonna establish the Pinelands National Reserve which is roughly 1.1 million acres, uh, 56 towns, 22% of the state of New Jersey is uh, within the Pinelands National Reserve. A year later, the state of New Jersey passes the Pinelands Protection Act, and that creates uh, a state Pinelands area. It creates the New Jersey Pinelands Commission, um, and that kind of puts the, the, you know, the preservation in the play at the state level. Um, the Pinelands Commission's first job is to create a comprehensive management plan to kind of oversee land use in the Pinelands, uh, and that is done, and it is signed and goes into effect on January 14th of 1981, so a little over 40 uh, years ago is when the Pinelands plan comes into play, and then in 1983, um, the reserve, the Pinelands National Reserve, is then recognized um, as an international biosphere by the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization also known as UNESCO. Uh, and so that's when the area gets its designation as a uh, biosphere reserve. Um, the northern portion of the Pinelands is up here in Ocean County. This is Jackson Township. Uh, it does, the Federal Reserve goes out and includes Island Beach State Park. It does even include Barnegat Lake State Park. Uh, comes down and includes today what's a lot of the Foresight Refuge. Uh, portions of Ocean County, Atlantic County, um, there's a kind of an area down here, you know, uh, political process, polit legislation is always political. One of the old theories was there was a senator from Atlantic County who uh, had a lot of influence. I think his last name was Percy. And they said that's Percy's thumb, that area of the, that was left out. Um, but a lot of that area had already been developed. So the other argument would be that the Pinelands characteristics were no longer in that area. Um, but anyway, that uh, this is the boundary for the Pinelands National Reserve, catches the upper portion of Cape May, then catches uh, portions of Cumberland County, Gloucester County, Camden County, and then Burlington County. So that's the seven counties, again, 56 uh, municipalities. Um, here's the original CMP. Uh, basically, it's the rules to promote development, but to uh, encourage and safeguard the natural resources but allow for the economy to survive. So it's kind of that balance between protecting the resources and uh, allowing uh, people to survive and have a good economy. Um, we'll look in a minute about some different zones. How are they gonna do this? It's gonna be a regional plan, kind of zoning for the whole area with the ultimate goal of protecting water quality and natural resources. Um, here's the, what we refer to today as the land capability map. These are nine management areas. 60% um, is generally conservation. Agriculture, uh, you have the cranberry industry, you have the blueberry industry. Um, some of the yellow on the map is kind of a transition or a buffer area. 
And then the development areas are regional growth areas, and then the pre-existing pylons, towns, and villages, which are red and purple. Um, well, over roughly the last 40 years, about 75% of all the development that's occurred in the pinelands has been in that 13% of the pinelands. So in the orange, red, or purple portions, that's where most of the development has occurred. And that's really how the plan was developed. The plan was to protect the resources and the water in the preservation area and in the forest area, and then to allow growth to occur in the areas that had um, infrastructure like public water and public sewer, uh, whereas the interior areas do not. So you would have a, a well and you would have a, uh, you know, a, a, a private uh, septic system. Um, the plan lays out environmental standards, which hold out through all the management areas. Um, the rules of the regulations are also the same rules and regulations that are in the master plans of the counties and the municipalities. So the rules just aren't Pinelands rules. They're actually municipal rules as well. Um, the commission would review all private and public development applications. So if a town proposed an application, that's a public. And if an individual proposed, that, that is a private. Um, and also the commission has the authority because it's kind of done in concert with the municipalities to overturn any municipal decisions that are um, not consistent or you know, don't go along with the plan. Uh, and also there's cultural resource standards. Uh, so these are um, historic resources, which could be anything from our recent history, but also as far back as archeological evidence from the, the Lenape that lived here prior to uh, the European settlement. Um, why would they wanna protect the Pinelands? Water, water, water everywhere. Basically, the, the sands of the Pinelands work as a huge water filter to collect water that go down into the Cohansey and the Kirkwood. So they're just basically layers of sand that hold the water. Uh, if you have a house and a well, you're pulling from the Cohansey. If a municipality is pulling a large uh, water line, it's probably coming up out of the Kirkwood. So uh, the water would go from the sand into the aquifer and then come back up into the surface waters. So it's really all connected. It's really one big system. Um, the sand below the pine lands has the ability to hold about 17.7 trillion gallons of water. Um, so if we paved over the pine lands, we would no longer be recharging the aquifer. And over time, uh, we would run out of water and we would thus you know, have drastic um, consequences for you know, the people and the environment. If you covered the whole state, 10 foot deep in water, that's roughly the amount of water we think the Pine Barrens aquifers can hold. Um, today, uh, roughly 500,000 people live in the area. Um, smaller towns like Chatsworth, um, bigger towns like Hamilton, Medford, Tuckerton, uh, there's a thriving population. Uh, it's always interesting, you know, the population today is about 500,000. That Jeffport plan was to make a city of just 250,000. So they would have really almost you know, double the population just for that one project. So there's a lot of uh, history and a lot of culture associated with all these different communities spread throughout uh, the area. Um, some of that folklore and culture, uh, the Jersey Devil is probably one of the first stories that we always talk about. Uh, it goes back to the 1730s, 1735. Um, Mrs. Lee apparently was supposedly had 12 children. And when she heard of a 13th, she said, I can't bear to have another child. And uh, thus, uh, there was a creature born with the head of a horse, wings of a bat, a forked tail, and cloven hooves, uh, which some people today would say still roams the area. There's all kinds of different stories. One story says it lived in the backyard. Another story says it ate the family. Um, but you know, people have heard a lot of strange noises and a lot of strange sights. And uh, I always tell the kids when they're out in the woods not to leave any trash because you never know who's watching. Um, uh, working the cycle, you know, traditionally when people were living off of the natural resources, you would work the cycle. So there'd be part of the year where you might uh, clam and fish and hunt. There might be another part of the year where you go out into the woods and collect sphagnum moss. You might go help your friend who has cranberries or blueberries. And that was working the cycle. There are all the traditional jobs you could do to make a living. Uh, some of those folks who would do that, uh, a term, uh, the term piney would be applied to someone who lived in the pines and made a living from the area. Uh, initially, 
uh, the term was a derogatory term in some ways. Um, but over time, uh, you know, people have kind of looked at it in a different way. You know, most people today that live in the area will say, I'm proud to be a Piney. And, um, you know, it's not a derogatory term at all. It's just a term for people that live in the area or are, you know, love the area of the Pine Barrens. Um, so, you know, one of the things people say a lot today is I'm proud to be a, a Piney from my head to my honey or from my nose to my toes. Uh, people also say once you get some of that sugar sand caught between your toes, it never goes away. So there's a, you know, there's a real love uh, for the area. Um, the area has always had a lot of music and uh, you could go hear that music every Saturday night. There's a place called Albert Hall, which is in Waretown off of Route 532. Um, back in the late seventies, the Albert brothers from that Waretown area actually had people come to their cabin and they'd have an open mic you know, on the weekends. And over time that developed and still to this day, you can go to Albert Hall and uh, you pay $5 to get in and you can see up to five or seven bands every Saturday. It's a, it's a real cheap date night, but it's a, it's a great place. You know, real cultural aspect of the, uh, the Pine Barrens area. Uh, we're also known for boats. In particular, the white cedar was uh, used to build a Garvey, which is a flat bottom boat, flat bottom boat rather, that was used for clamming and oystering. And then the Barnegat Bay sneak box was used primarily for duck hunting. And uh, you would cover up the sneak box and hide. You would build Barnegat Bay decoys, which would then float in the water, made out of white cedar as well, to try to entice the ducks to come in. One of the things we talked about before was market duck hunting. You know, people made a living by hunting the waterfowl of the area. Um, I showed you some of the well-known towns and there's a lot of lost or, or you know, ghost towns. Places like this is the remnants of Harrisville, which is a paper factory, but there's little towns all over the Pine Barrens area that once had people in industry, but over time, those industries kind of moved away. Eventually the people moved away and now nothing is really left except the ruins and the roads. So there literally are roads that crisscross the whole entire Pine Lands area that used to lead to places like Harrisville or Friendship, Eagle. There's lots and lots of these uh, you know, lost towns uh, scattered throughout uh, the whole Pine Barrens area. Um, today, modern day, we have agriculture. Uh, here's the, uh, the blueberries around Hamilton. Uh, I think more or less New Jersey is around number four today as far as producer of uh, cranberries and blueberries. We were a little bit higher, but places like Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Michigan all have a lot more acreage. So they're growing more berries than we are even though I think New Jersey berries per acre, both in cranberries and blueberries, is the highest yield. Um, here's the wet harvest. Uh, as I said before, they shake the berries, they come to the top and they are collected. Generally, the berries in New Jersey are primarily part of the Ocean Spray Collective, which is a group of farmers that bring their crop to market together. And most of it is made in the juice and or cranberry sauce because the wet harvest is very rough on the berries. So it um, kind of beats them up. So generally they're made in the products. If you're buying berries, um, you know, whole berries, generally they're still picked by hand. Um, but the ones in the juice and the sauce are all done through this wet process. Um, today, people look at the pine lands for recreation. I kind of like to say it's wilderness in your backyard. Uh, it's a great place for camping, birding, biking, hiking, canoeing, uh, just exploring. Uh, still to this day, there's a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting. Uh, there's a lot of motorcycle. Uh, you can drive around the, the roads in the Pine Lands. There's a lot less traffic. So on the weekends, you certainly see some motorcycles out there. Uh, you know, people come to birding. The Foresight Refuge is here. The Cape May Wildlife Refuge is here. There's lots and lots of opportunities for all that and much more. Roughly um, over a million people a year come to the Pine Lands just to visit the area, go to the state parks and forests. Um, we have a 50-mile hiking trail called the Batona Trail, which starts in um, Brendan Burns State Forest and travels through Wharton State Forest and eventually ends in Bass River State Forest. You can spend, you know, three, four days just hiking the Batona Trail uh, in the Pinelands. Um, here's a native pickerel. That's one of the fish that you could catch if you were fishing in the Pine Barrens area. And then, of course, there's lots and lots of kayaking, canoeing on the... Um, Mullica River, the Batstow River, there's Cedar Creek up by Tom's River, um, Oyster Creek, uh, down south, the Great Egg, Tuckahoe, 
over in the Rancocos, there's lots and lots of places to go canoeing and kayaking in the Pine Barrens. Uh, here's a quick list of our state forest areas. Um, Allaire is just to the north, but it's a very good example of a bog iron uh, processing facility. So it's very similar to what you would have seen at Batstow. And then of course, Bass River, Brendan T. Byrne, which was known as Lebanon State Forest at one time. Um, Bell Plain is down towards Cape May. Uh, Double Trouble is over by Tom's River. Uh, the Forest Resource Education Center, that's near Jackson. That's a great place to learn about forestry. Also the state nurseries there. Um, Island Beach State Park, as I said, is considered in the Pine Barrens or Pine Lands. And then Penn State Forest, which is managed um, primarily through Wharton and Bass River. And then of course, Wharton State Forest, where you would find Batstow Village. That's the Batstow Mansion uh, right there. Um, getting towards the end here, I think I'm a little bit over time. Um, roughly 80% uh, of the forested areas of the area are within the Pine Lands. Um, this is a typical pine forest, which is the majority of uh, the habitat. Um, you're going to have pine to oak, places where there's more fire, you have more pine. Where there's less fire, you're going to start to see more oak come in. Um, that's going to be in the uplands. Our most transitional areas are what we would say is a pitch pine lowland. So that's kind of a link between the uplands and the wetlands, where you see both upland and wetland plants. And then in the wetlands, there's a hardwood swamps. Uh, where you're going to find a lot of the cherries and maples. And then, of course, Atlantic white cedar swamps, where you're going to find the white cedar. I, you know, we talked about a couple times what an important resource the white cedar was. Uh, our wetlands make up 35% of the area. That's where a lot of our threatened endangered animals and plants are. Um, very low nutrients. This is the soil. Uh, the biggest difference between the wetlands and the uplands is the soils. Wetland soils are considered muckier and they have a lot more organic material and they tend to drain slower. So in the uplands, they drain fast. In the wetlands, they drain slow. Because of that, you have different plants, plants that need water or need more of a wet environment are gonna be your wetland plants. Uh, this is a savanna. Savannas are a really cool uh, wetland area. Um, there's not as many trees in the savannas, so they allow a lot more sunlight. And that's where we're going to find a lot of the, the flowers and orchids that occur in the Pine Barrens. Um, here's the Pine Plains. That's back where we started. So this is that picture of the, the Pine Plains area. Um, there's not a lot of natural lakes in the area, but we have thousands of these intermittent ponds. So this is, say, June. And if you come back in August, it's going to dry up. And uh, because of those intermittent ponds, we have a huge variety of play, um, frogs, toads, and salamanders. If those ponds had water year round, there would be fish in the ponds. Therefore, we would not have the populations and the diversity of uh, the, the frogs and toads and salamanders. Uh, here's the Pine Barrens tree frog. Um, today is a threatened species. Uh, back when the plan started, it was an endangered species. So over those 40 years, uh, we've preserved a lot of its habitat. So it's... Um, Population numbers have increased, so it's in better shape. Uh, there's about 500 other animals that occur here, and I get 43 that are also threatened and endangered. Um, several of our, of our local uh, reptiles and um, amphibians, things like the corn snake, the pine snake, this is a tiger salamander. We have one venomous snake in the area, and that's the timber rattlesnake. Here are some of our native fishes, uh, the ones with the stars are only found in the Pine Barrens, like the Black Bandit, the Bandit Sunfish, uh, the Pirate Perch. Um, here are the pickerel. You can find them both in and out. And then also we have American eels, which begin life in the salt water, but then come up here into the freshwater. Um, plants, uh, the Pine Lands is known as a botanical treasure. There's about 850 that occur here, 92 that are considered threatened and endangered or protected. And there's 27 wild orchids. Uh, this plant right here is uh, the swamp pink lily, which is a plant that generally we say likes its feet wet. So it's a plant you'd find in those wetlands. This happens to be in a cedar swamp. Here's our uh, pitch pine. Uh, the bark of the pine really protects it from forest fire. And then it's got some cones that are serotonous that only open with fire and then other cones that open from the sunlight. Um, 
and what happens is the forest fire burns, it pops all the cones. So the first tree to grow is going to be the pitch pine. That's why in areas with fire, the pitch pine is the most dominant. The next most dominant tree is the black jack oak. It's got a real shiny leaf. Here's a good example. Uh, so they're the two most numerous trees in the pine lands, the pitch pine and the black jack oak. We'll get into some of the uh, plants real quick. Here's the pink lady slipper, which is an upland plant, and then the pine barrens gentian, which you would consider a wetland plant. Uh, you actually see it on the side of roads because there's usually a ditch with water. So that's a great spot to see some of those pine barren gentians uh, you know, growing along the roadsides in the area. We're known for carnivorous plants because the pH is so low. A lot of the plants adapt by coming up with other mechanisms to get nutrients. So we've got bladderwort, which uh, kind of filters water and microorganisms. We've got sundews, which kind of hold the plants and digest them. And then the pitcher plant, where the plant go, the bud goes in and can't make it out and is eventually digested. So we've had a whole suite of these carnivorous plants found here uh, in the area. And uh, then some of the orchids, um, the uh, dragon's mouth orchid, grass pink. This is the orange fringe, the southern yellow, uh, the bog asphodel is really unique. The only place in the world that is found today is in the New Jersey Pine Barrens so, or the Pine Lands. So this is a very rare plant. The only ones that we know of are here, no place else in the world. Um, to kind of wrap things up, I just want to talk about, uh, you know, if you're out enjoying the area, enjoying the history, enjoying the ecology, uh, you know, responsible recreation, uh, we don't want to leave anything behind, you know, leave no trace. If you're driving through the Pine Barrens on those dirt roads, stay on the roads. Don't drive in the bogs, don't drive in the meadows, you know, stay on the roads, it's very important. Um, and also drive legal licensed vehicle. Uh, a four-wheeler or a two-stroke dirt bike, it's not legal to drive in the state forest. So if you do, you can certainly get in a lot of trouble and it can be confiscated. Uh, there's a lot of hunting and fishing, but if you're gonna hunt and you're gonna fish, please know the regulations because like I said before, you never know who's watching. Um, the, there's conservation officers, there's park police, there's you know lots of people out there. So like I said, try to be responsible if you're gonna um, you know, go out and enjoy the, the, the pine lands. Uh, if you see someone out there uh, doing some of these things, like you can see a pond in the background that's been tore up. Uh, here's the number, you could call the DEP uh, for uh, things in the state forest areas. And then you can call the conservation officers uh, for any wildlife, wildlife violations that you see. So if you see something, say something. And uh, with that, I will uh, wrap up. I think I went a little bit too long, but uh, thanks for bearing with me and I'll be glad to help answer uh, any questions that you must have. Great, thank you so much, Joel. That was a lot of information, but uh, wow. it was great to great to hear all of it. So um, yes, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to submit them using the the chat function or the Q and A function, and we'll be happy to to answer them for you. Um, you touched on this a little bit uh, before about the uh, the bog iron, but somebody asked, was all of the bog iron depleted from the pine barrens? Uh, no, definitely not. Um, you know, uh, and it's naturally occurring. So over time, more would occur. Uh, but what really was happening, it just was getting too expensive and too much labor to uh, get the bog iron to the furnaces. Uh, there was both furnaces and forges, uh, you know, to stamp out uh, the products, to flatten out the products. But that's what happened. Ultimately, it just became too expensive to bring the iron to the places uh, to process it. Uh, do you know if Stockton has finished their study of the Revolutionary War ships the British sank in the Maluka? Uh, I have read a couple very interesting articles. I know they've done, uh, and there's been a couple other studies as well over time where divers have gone in and they've been able to salvage some of those uh, ships that were scuttled uh, in that Chestnut Neck area. Uh, but I don't know if the if Stockton study is done or, or not at this time. How are the deer managed in the pine lands? Uh, the deer are managed um, through the, uh, you know, the Division of uh, Wildlife, uh, Fish and Wildlife. Um, the deer population is kind of an interesting story. About, uh, say, 20 years ago, we really first started to see coyotes show up in uh, the area. And um, 
not too long after that, we could definitely see a distinct drop in the deer population, particularly west of the parkway in the forested areas. And I think what happened is once the coyotes came into the area, the, uh, the deer weren't really able to cope with the coyotes. And so thus that population started to crash. Uh, over time, we saw kind of a um, movement of the deer population. So the deer kind of moved into more of the residential areas, maybe east of the parkway, where the coyotes weren't as bold. And then um, were able to kind of flourish in those residential areas. But now, say 20 years, 30 years from the initial uh, appearance of the coyotes, we've seen where the deer populations have kind of come back in both places. So now the deer population in the forested areas and the residential areas are, are both probably pretty high. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Uh, we had a, a few people ask about if this was being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded um, and a link will be sent to everybody uh, probably either this afternoon or tomorrow. So just be on the lookout for that in your email. Um, is this the same type of bog that the Irish peat comes from? I, th I think it's a little bit different. It's, a, it's similar in some ways. Uh, and there are some reports of when they would take the, the bog iron out of the ground, it was kind of soft and they needed to really let it dry out over time before they would start to process it. But I do think there is some differences uh, in the, the, the chemical breakdown of the two. Um, what made you choose to, to join the Pinelands Commission? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, I, I was fortunate to grow up in the area and I always had a, you know, a, a wanting to know more about the history. Uh, you know, I, I was very familiar with the forest and all the roads and I noticed all the roads kind of had a name. I really wanted to know where they went or, you know, what was that all about? And it, it turns out that all those roads did actually go somewhere. And so that was really one of the initial things as a kid that I really was interested in to find out, you know, where's this road to Shemung? What does this mean? And, and that's really got me kind of exploring the area and kind of set me on the path to uh, ultimately get a degree in history and then someday come back and work for the Pine Lands Commission. Is anyone preserving the music of the Pine Lands? Are there any traditional piney musicians left? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's an organization called the Pine Lands Cultural Society, and they uh, that's who runs and operates Albert Hall. And uh, they've, they've got CDs, uh, they've got a, a lot of musicians. And like I said, every Saturday night, if you want to uh, get a real good glimpse of the, the culture and the music of the area, uh, you want to go to, to Waretown, uh, it's right off of uh, Route 532, not too far off of Route 9, and Albert Hall is right next to the uh, Ocean Township Elementary School in the little community of uh, Waretown. Right. Uh, approximately how old are the pitch pines in the preserved area? Um, I'm in the Chadsworths area and the pines don't appear too old. Were they forested or burned? Uh, there, there's, there's been a continual amount of fire over time. Uh, some of those trees could be a lot older than you think, just because they don't tend to grow in the Pine Plains in particular. They don't tend to grow so high, but they put a lot more effort into their roots. Um, so in some cases, they could be 50 years old. In some cases, they might even be 100 years old. It just depends on the amount of fire or if they were, you know, cleared uh, at a certain pertinent time. Just because a tree is short doesn't mean it's not that old. Alrighty, we can give it a few more minutes okay. to see if any other questions come in. But um, any, what, what's your favorite aspect of the Pinelands, Joel? Oh, it's it's hard to say. You know, I I, I spend a lot of time uh, kayaking. I love to get out and, and float the rivers. Uh, growing up, I did a lot of fishing, and uh, you know, one of the things my family has always done is a lot of hunting in the area. So uh, you know, I just really spent like to spend a lot of time out in the outdoors, and uh, it's great to you know, be in an area where you could kind of get away from everybody and just slide out into the woods. And the, the pine barrens or pine lands are great for, for that ability. Um, you always kind of still hear the parkway or you see an airplane fly by, but it, it gives you that sense. You know, that's kind of where that idea of wilderness in your backyard, uh, it's, it's not that too far away uh, if you live here in South Jersey. All right. Well, I'd just like to extend my thanks and this thanks from the audience to you, Joel, for a fantastic presentation. Um, it was really, really informative, enlightening, 
um, and a real sense of Jersey pride. So we thank you for that. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm born and raised here and I love to talk about it. So uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, uh, thanks a lot. So just like to close with everybody, be safe, be well. And if you have a chance, go explore the Pinelands. See you out there.